Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get started soon. If everyone wants to settle down, I'll be starting. So I'm Skylar St. Ledger, and today I'm going to be talking about software-defined radio and what you can and what you can use it for, and why, what makes it a versatile and useful tool. So just to get started, how many of you here have heard of software-defined radio? Okay. How many of you have done something with software-defined radio? Okay. So software-defined radio is it replaces a having a dedicated radio to receive a certain protocol and decode it and doing a lot of that in hardware and maybe some custom chips too. It does that pretty much all in software with just some minimal hardware stuff for the RF. So here's a block diagram of a software-defined radio. Um, it's kind of hard to find a good block diagram of a software-defined radio online. But this is a pretty good one. So essentially what you have is, here's your antenna. And down here, this is the transmit section, and this is the receive section. So you go through a few amplifiers and filters to help clean up the signal. Then goes through what's called a mixer to shift it from a high frequency, like maybe 900 megahertz, down to, it shifts the whole frequency down to around zero hertz around it. And it also splits it into what's called a, the complex waveform, which is you have an I and a Q signal. And you use complex numbers because they make signal processing a lot easier. And then it goes through an amplifier into an ADC, and this will go into your computer. And to transmit, you have the same thing pretty much in reverse. You have a digital to analog converter to generate your signal, goes through an amplifier, into the mixer, another amplifier, and goes out to the antenna. So while it is software-defined radio, you do need some hardware, except that hardware is extremely versatile. So there's lots of different hardware. This isn't a complete list, but these are just some of them. There, you can get a TV tuner dongle, like this Realtek dongle. And these are really cheap. You can get them for around $20 online. And they have a pretty wide frequency range. The upper range varies. For some of them, it's 1,500 megahertz. Other ones go up to 1,700 megahertz. These are really cool because they're cheap. And if you want to see if you like software defined radio, you can play around with one of these without spending a lot of money. Medium cost, there's the FunCube Dongle Pro Plus. That's receive only. All of these other ones on here, like receive and transmit. Um, the Hack RF one's kind of a big one. Today, I'm going to be using the Blade RF, which is another open source one. And then the higher cost ones, there's the USRPs, and which are made by Edis Research. And those are also good ones. They're just more expensive. Um, and then there's the UMTRX and Matchstick. Matchstick is actually cool. It uses the same RF transceiver I see that's in here, except it shrinks it down and is fairly small. And then the UMTRX uses essentially two of the Blade RFs with an Ethernet connection instead of USB. And then for software, a lot of the software you're going to be using is going to be with GNU Radio, which it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's kind of a big software thing that you have to install, and it takes a while, and that's fun. Um, you're probably best off doing it on Linux or Mac. On Mac, you can just use Mac's port, Mac ports. On Linux and Ubuntu, I believe it's with an app dash git. And Windows, I'm not going to try doing that. <laughs> uh, to talk to the hardware, there's a library called GR Osmo SDR. And it provides you with a standard interface for the same. I can use the same code to interface with the Blade RF, TV tuner dongle, a USRP, all sorts of hardware. Um, it also has this cool thing called Phosphor in it, which it, it uses GPU acceleration to show a really fast view of the frequency spectrum, which I'll show you. And then all this other software, LinRAD, SDR Sharp, HDSDR, and GQRX, that software is all for just looking at the spectrum. Um, I'm going to be using GQRX in the Phosphor thing because I have a Mac and they run on it. And GNU Radio you, has a tool called GNU Radio Companion, which lets you create a graphical flowchart for looking at, for analyzing signals. So these are some signals I have pre-recorded just because it's easy. So this is Wi-Fi. Um, just to see, does anyone know what 6 or 2.437 megahertz is? Channel 5? I believe it's channel 6. I'm pretty sure. 
Yeah, so here you can actually see Wi-Fi has fixed channels. I mean, it doesn't frequency hop. So you see right here, there's the Wi-Fi channel here of 20 megahertz. And you can actually see here, there's a lot of data being sent. So you see each of these are a bunch of frames stacked together. A microwave, it just kind of spews RF everywhere. You can see this, it's spewing it here. And it clobbers over Wi-Fi. So here's looking at Wi-Fi here and a microwave here. And it just kind of clobbers over everything. So now we'll look at some actual things. Um, let me mirror my screens. This, OK. So first, I'm going to start out looking at some things. Um, a fun spectrum portion of the spectrum to look at is the 900 megahertz band. And that's fun because it's used by all sorts of things. A lot of um, like everything from smart meters to pagers use portions of that band. So you, you can so once you have everything installed, you can do osmocom FFT dash F to open phosphor it with phosphor. And it should open. And this it's really cool. It uses CUDA to do so what happens is the signal you're getting, it's the whole portion of the spectrum that you're looking at. So to get this, yeah, this doesn't work well on small screens. To get this uh, view, what it does is it uses acceleration. It uses, or uses the GPU to accelerate this. So if we see something, we should see something here. So like this peak here, or this peak here, this is from a pager. Um, pagers rely around 929, 930 megahertz. Um, there's not too much else here that I'm seeing now. Um, in the 900 megahertz band, you'll see smart meters are there. And SRP smart meters use the 900 megahertz band. Don't do anything malicious, but they do. You can look up the FCC filing report. Um, other fun stuff, so like wireless microphones, you can look at them. This one's 518 megahertz. Yes, so this is this is the wireless microphone, and you can see it, the voice being modulated as I talk. So what you're seeing here is this is frequency, and this is the amplitude, which is it'd be nice if you could scale this, but it's 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 a it's a good GUI for written by programmers. But you can see, so here's the microphone, and as I talk, it's frequency modulated. So as I talk, it modulates the signal back and forth. So other things you can look at are all sorts of things. Um, ceiling fan remote controls are fun because they're very simple. Um, you can typically just record them and play them back, and you can remotely control your ceiling fan. Um, and then the complex signals, um, which one is it? Uh, hold on. Um, huh. Hold on. So the quadrature signals, what they do is they are, are you familiar with complex numbers? No? OK. So essentially what it does is when you're looking at the real portion of a signal, you're only seeing Think of it like you're looking at a slinky from the side. So you only see half of it. So this is a sine wave in this case. By mixing it with the two different signal, signals that are out of phase, you shift the frequency down so you can sample it. And you then make it be quadrature and complex. So when you look at it, you then get a spiral type thing. And in this case, this is what's called, this would be phase shift keying, where this, what you're seeing, the direction that the spiral spinning is the phase. So it's when the signal repeats. The speed that it spins at is the frequency. And the distance from the center is the amplitude. So are you all familiar with AM radio or amplitude modulated? So with AM radio, you can either do something where you sample it really quickly and you have a sine wave and you average it out and that kind of works well. But the problem is, is that you have to oversample it a lot what you can do with complex numbers is you take the, the magnitude, so the distance from the center, and that becomes your, 
it, it's your signal out. So now you don't have to oversample it and average it. You instead look at the distance from the center. So you'd see it it'd wobble around if this was an AM data. So with software-defined radio, there's also you can there's an, other things you can receive are you can actually receive radio or radio stations. Um, GNU Radio Companion is it will load. It's a, it gener actually it's cool. It generates Python code from your flowchart and uses Python code to do the signal processing. It the GNU Radio framework makes it work fairly well. Um, this should open. So one of the other things that's cool to look at is FM radio stations. They actually include a lot of data with the station, and this is how you see and this is how you see things like the station name, the music that's playing on your radio. What it will do is it's and this is also how you get stereo. FM radio does some really cool encoding tricks to where you can have an, if you have an old radio and you tune into a station that's broadcasting this stuff, you won't hear it because it's too high frequency. So what happens is, let me tune this to a station, um, uh, stop. let's see, this should turn up the gain. So yeah, so here, what you're seeing is, this is the frequency of the demodulated audio, and it goes up pretty high. So what you're seeing is, Around between 0 to 20 kilohertz, this is the left plus right audio. Then here's a pilot tone. And then somewhere in here, you have left minus right or right minus left audio, left minus right. And you also have the RDS data, which is radio data system. And that is how it displays the name. So you, this isn't. Uh, let me disable the thing so you can see it. Um, this should make it visible. GNU radio isn't great because the GUI will just go off the bottom of your screen. No, there should be a notebook I have to dis oh, I have to. Uh. So if you, once you disable everything and you can see the thing, you can actually see the data from the station and this one. The way this is done is actually, GNU Radio has some cool GUI layout tools or through WX widgets where you can um, have like a, a notebook, which is a series of things, except if you want to remove it, you have to disable everything else. And you can actually, it's nice you can disable it by selecting something and pressing D, or you can right click and disable it. Okay, so now, this should be decoding. Yeah, so here you can see it's um, decoding the data. And with FM radio, you have this. And so if you have a really old radio that doesn't support stereo, you'll hear the left plus right. If you have a newer radio that supports stereo, you'll hear that. And then if your radio doesn't support RDS, you'll hear that because it ignores the parts of the spectrum where the data is transmitted. And with uh, software defined radio, you can do other things. Like you can, this is a flow graph I made to control the, our ceiling fan. Um, this, so what this code does is, can't zoom out. So what this code does is it starts with a vector source, which is really just an, really big array of when it should be transmitting something and when it should not be transmitting something because the ceiling fan remote's just on off keying pretty fast and it if it's so this is interpreted as a zero and this is interpreted as a one, the one, one zero and the one zero. And then you put a bunch of zeros here to give it space between the packets. It goes through a throttle block because in GNU Radio, you can set the sample rate. But if the sample rate isn't going to a hardware source, like a actual radio peripheral, it will send the samples as fast as your CPU can handle them, and it will make your computer really unhappy. And then it interpolates this to get it up to a sample rate, so it's not one sample per bit. It averages them to smooth it, smooth it out. 
And then what we're doing is we're taking the complex data and we're looking at the magnitudes, the distance from the center, and we're showing that on a scope plot. So you'll have time and the amplitude. So you can use, you can set the triggering so it will stop it when it receives a signal and turn off auto range so it doesn't change things on us. And if we expand the time, we can see this. So what we can see here is there, you have the short pulse, then a long pulse, and what these are is these are, so a short pulse like a, would be the one zero, then this would be one one zero, and you can decode this, so this would be, end up being zero, one, 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 <coughs> one, bunch of zeros and a one, and this, essentially the way I've done this is you press a button, you look at it, you press another button, you look at it, um, so in this case, whichever bit here is one, <coughs> And that bit is the bit it sets light, set the fan to low, medium, or high, reverse the fan, turn the fan off. The, this bit here, actually no. So this, ah, scrolling, it, normally it doesn't scroll. When it, so this, let's see, yes. So it has a zero one as a preamble. The four bits here are the ID of your ceiling fan and remote. So in this case, it's one, 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 one. Then if this, this bit's a one, it ends up dimming the light versus turning the light on and off. So depending on the type of light you have. And this is cool because you can, potentially with this, you can make something where you can jam all the ceiling fan remotes or if you have a high enough power transmitter. Not that this is a good idea, but it would make a very funny video. You turn on and off all the ceiling fans in your neighborhood. Ideally, you'd have all your neighbors have the same ones or you make it where it transmits all of them. But it, it's really fun doing this. So yeah, my parents don't enjoy it when the light starts blinking and then they don't get happy, but it's fun and you can transmit this. This won't do anything because I don't have a ceiling fan. Other cool things you can do is with software defined radio, you can, there's this toy called the IME. It, it's, it's far more useful than it looks. It has, it has a processor in it. It's the Kipcon CC1110, which is now a TI part. These are no longer made, you can find them on Amazon and eBay. Um, and the IME is really cool because you can reprogram it to do all sorts of fun things. Um, Travis Goodspeed, his good fat, um, let me turn on my camera so you can see this. Uh, so the good fat has an adapter, so on the IME, Beneath the battery, okay. So beneath the battery, there are these test pins, and with the good fet, which is a really cool programmer board that can program all sorts of things. If you're if you want to do hardware hacking and program and reverse engineering software, the good fet is a useful tool to have. It's also it's also, you have to solder it yourself and it's surface mount, but it's, it's fairly easy. So you can actually, the good FET, there's an adapter called the good gimme, the good FET IME. And this you can plug on, to, or you, it has these pogo pins, which are cool, they're like a pogo stick. And you, th that's where the name comes from. You plug it on and you can program it. So this isn't the greatest as far as the RF like performance goes, but it's nice having a small thing you can carry around in your pocket. So what you can do with it is you can program it. Uh, so you can, let me connect this. They really need a bigger podium for hardware demos. <laughs> Or a table where you can see the stuff. So if I connect this, you do have to hold on the thing while you're programming it, but it's not that bad. If you do, so the software is on GitHub. It's uh, it's under. It's I'll show you it. And that the serial port's weird. It it doesn't. You have to. 
Serial port is weird for this, but it works. Um, so this will actually act as a spectrum analyzer on this, and this can do the 900 megahertz band. It can do 300-ish megahertz and 400 megahertz. So you can do most remotes and stuff. Um, one of the cool things that they did with this is they made it where you can record a garage door open, a signal from a garage door opener, and play it back. So you could. They didn't have the rolling code working, but what you could do with it is you could record the signal from someone's garage door opener while it's not within range. You use this to play it back and open it, and then you add a universal remote so you have access to their garage door for, or their house for as long as you want. Yes, is, aren't things fun? <laughs> And so, the, so I modified that code to work as a remote for the ceiling fan. Currently, it only does the light because there's one button. I'm working on adding code where you don't need to reprogram it every time to change the um, to change the code it sends and the frequency, which you currently have to do. This should finish flashing. This takes a while to flash. It's it's annoying. And. Should be done. Let me open the camera so I can show you this. This is Done? No. So this is the annoying part of developing for this, is that when you want to try it, it takes a while to flash. Um, should be done. I think it's, I, the time it takes, yeah, okay, it's done. So with this, so let's see the backlight. You, so this is actually acting as a spectrum analyzer now. Is that mirrored? Yeah, people can see it. Okay, so what this does, so this has a wide, ultra wide, and <laughs> narrow. Let me. Um, or there's a backlight. Is this better? No, that's uh, there better. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, so here, let's see. So here you can see. Make that bigger. So here you can see this is looking at around where pagers are. So this peak, this peak, those peaks there are pagers. Um, you can actually kind of see the modulation. You see the two peaks. The, it uses a frequency shift keying. So what that is, instead of changing the amplitude, it changes the frequency, like frequency modulation, but changes between two states or multiple states. Um, pagers aren't, it's elite, in the US, it's illegal to decode the alphanumeric ones. It's considered wiretapping. So don't do it. Um, <laughs> however, I, interesting side note, just the hypothetical idea though. The, the chip in this, I do believe it supports the same modulation that pagers use. Just saying. Yes, just saying. <laughs> and so there's other code like, um, Uh, this is smaller, so it, it should be faster. There. I think there's an issue with it resets when you connect it to the IME because it's powering it and it browns out and it takes a second to fill the capac the capacitor or something. Also, I have the backlight on, which probably isn't helping. So this code is the for the um, uh, for the ceiling fan remote or to transmit the code. So if I open GNU Radio and I go to the receiving one, you can this is it. So is it done, Flash? Okay. So this is looking at it 
over. So this is that same view, except this is showing what um, the signal from the signal over time that's being received by my radio. Um, darn. The, the connector, it's, yeah, I bumped the connector. And when you bump the connector, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't reconnect automatically unless you, you have to restart it. And kill that. So now. I won't disconnect it. Um, so now, so this is just noise that you're getting. Um, so that that's setting up the trigger, so it doesn't. And now, if you transmit this, you see or fewer, or no more. Zoom out. So what you're seeing here. Uh, count. Move it down. So what's happening now is this. So this is that signal being transmitted. Um, so you see, let me, this is, this is, so ah, there. So what you're seeing here is the short, the 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and then the 1. So this is actually transmitting it. And the cool part about this is that you can, Event, I, with the code that I'm hoping to eventually write, you should be able to, you could actually type in the values you want for transmit. And so while this isn't technically a software defined radio, it's a very versatile software configurable radio with a keyboard and a very stylish housing. <laughs> so along with all these things, you can also, another thing that's interesting is, um, have any of you heard of the thing or the great seal bug? So it was such kind of a cool thing. Um, Russia, they gave the US embassy in Moscow, I believe it was, as a symbol of diplomatic relations, this US seal. Except inside it, they hid this bug that was a, it had a microphone in it that was acting as a capacitor. So it had two metal things that vibrated with the sound and it was tuned with a coil to an antenna. So they'd beam RF at it and people talking would change the capacitance which would change the frequency that it resonated at. And it'd re-reflect some of the RF, but the frequency would vary. So what you could, they would do is, it's completely passive. So they, shine, they illumin, illuminate it with a RF beam, and they listen back for a signal coming back. And they could actually hear what people were saying. And as soon as they turned it off, it wasn't transmitting anything, and it didn't need any batteries. So the NSA, with the documents that were leaked, one of the documents was the NSA Ant Catalog. Have any of you heard of it? So it's a bunch of cool things the NSA has, and some of them are very similar to what we have. Like there's something that looks like a Wi-Fi pineapple, except is has a compact flash card and is older. So they have in there a series of these, what are called retroreflectors. And retroreflectors are where you shine something at it and it reflects it straight back. So like the signs on a highway have that, a material that does that with light. So it goes back at you regardless of the angle you see the signs at. So these aren't really retroreflectors, but they're what they're called. And using software to find radio, you can do cool stuff. Like the, so Mike Osman has built some of these implants. And you can embed them in something like a, um, like one of them, you, um, you hide it in a VGA cable. So you could actually see what's on someone's monitor. And it's cool as a software defined radio. With this one thing, you can do all sorts of things. Are there any questions? No? Yes? What? I have not heard of that. What? Can you speak up? You probably could. So GNU Radio Companion, it's useful for sticking together existing blocks. So over here, there are a bunch of blocks. So like 802.15.4, Zigbee and that stuff, there's a whole thing for that. All sorts of other stuff. 
The problem with it is if you want, it's not good for developing your own stuff. There's also a framework for um, like a Python and C++ libraries you can use. So you could probably do the damning stuff with it too. This is the Blade RF. It's around three or four, let's see, hold on. It is, depending on what you get, it's 420 or 465 dollars. Um, the difference is the size of the FPGA. So this has a fairly big FPGA in here. And what's cool is you can use that for doing stuff where if you don't, if you need time stuff with careful timing, Instead of doing it on your computer and sending it through USB, you can do it directly on the FPGA or on the built-in microcontroller. And what's the width? Like and with it goes up to around 40 megahertz. Yeah, so this can it can do 300 megahertz to 3.8 gigahertz. There is a uh, transverter board that will let you go down to I think it's 60 kilohertz. Yeah. The hack RF is another big one. The hack RF is another big one, and this can, has a really wide frequency range. You can kind of go below 10 megahertz and above 6 gigahertz, but its performance rolls off. The biggest difference is it has a narrower bandwidth of 20 megahertz, which is still really wide and you can do a lot in it. But you can fit almost the entire FM broadcast band in the 20 megahertz. Um, and then, so it's also not full duplex, so you can't transmit and receive. That's not a problem for most things. If you do, you could either get two of them or build something else. Yes? What do you see yourself doing in five or 10 years? <laughs> um, for a job? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, m more of this? <laughs> Can your dad adopt me? What? Well, your parents are doing a great job, so I'd like them to adopt me. <laughs> Daddy. <laughs> yes? Um, so, do you think it's uh, possible for you to uh, use some of your findings from all this to maybe make like, an application that auto logs people through the conferences into uh, software? So you, do, do you think it's possible to auto-log people coming to conferences with software? So you could, software-defined radios better, so that'd be more of using like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth from, right? Or what about just uh, maybe the handshake to the cell tower? Yeah, so actually one of the cool things is if you have a ham radio license, um, some of the international um, GSM cell phone bands that aren't using the US, but are covered under ham radio and part of the ISM band in like 800 megahertz. So with ham radio, you can transmit really high powers and you can actually use a ham radio license to set up a GSM base station. And you're required not to use encryption, which doesn't matter because GSM doesn't support encryption or lets you not use encryption. So you have a cellular base station where you're not using encryption and it's kind of cool because you can actually intercept people's phone calls and stuff. So if you get their phone to associate to you, and you can do this just by highest transmit power and some other tricks, like you could jam everyone else so you're the only tower available. Not that you should do this, but you might. You can, you can do that and they'll connect to you and you can look at the people and you could, put, so you can, do that and with that you can then track people so the NSA actually has some things where they have like a, a GSM tripwire they called it where when a person like a phone they were tracking moved into the area and it detected it it'd send them a notification um, if you want to look at other protocols that already have things for them like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi software defined radio is not the best software defined radio is good for looking at the lower levels like the RF stuff and the transmission you can do higher level stuff too but it's a lot more work and it requires a lot of processing power because it's all being done using software you need a, a, a non unsubstantial computer like doing doing the phosphor stuff is requires a non insignificant amount of computing power it looks really pretty. 
but it, it requires a lot of processing power because you're, so in this case I was doing like 30 mega samples per second, and this is 12 bit samples, so it's, and each sample is to a pair, an I and a Q for the complex thing. So you have, that would be 60 12 bit samples in a million 12 bit samples in a second. And then you're doing what's called a FFT on it, or fast Fourier transform, which takes in the signal of values and converts it to frequency over amplitude. So it requires a lot of processing power to do this stuff, but it's also cool because you can do all sorts of things. Um. So what university do you teach at? <laughs> yes. None. Yes, yet. Um, Are you licensed? I have a ham radio license. Um, yeah, so this is like 900 megahertz, the 900 megahertz band, it, it typically, so yeah, this stuff here, um, let me scale this, I'm using, you can use the arrow keys. So this stuff you're seeing here is some frequency hopping thing. Um, other stuff that's 900 megahertz, um, if you're at a university, they may have these like clicker things for student responses. Those are here. Um, Travis Goodspeed did an, something with one of the clickers uh, using this. Um, it's online. Um, so other stuff you see here. Um, other, so I've seen like all sorts of stuff is in 900 megahertz. It's really fun to look at when you're bored. Um, so like, well, this is fun. Like here's a pager. If you so. Um, Yes. Ooh, what's that? That's interesting. So if you um, hold on. Go to DSM. Um. Yes, I can. Hold on. Let me try and pull. So a pager. I like looking at pagers. It's nice as they're really high powered and they're pretty much everywhere. So you can't see this too well. Um, you can kind of see it. The, the those are two separate ones. You can see the kind of it. It's going back and forth because it's using frequency shift keying, I believe. Um. I'm not, hold on. I'm not sure what this signal is. So GQRX, um, qubit. Do you have a cell phone in that range also? Um, yeah, I think so, maybe. Um, actually, let me, um, let me try demodulating the audio. So GQ, so phosphor is nice because it's really pretty and shows you detail. It does what's called a real-time spectrum analyzer-like view, where it shows you the amount of time spent at different frequencies and amplitudes. However, it, it doesn't let you demodulate any of the data. Or, so GQRX is software. It doesn't use phosphor, but it's nice because it lets you demodulate data. Um, it's fun. GQRX is fun because when you start it, if it can't find the device it was configured for, it crashes. You get to restart it, and then it lets you change the settings. Uh, OK. Um, let's see, like 9.33. Let me turn this off. So. Let me set the, what's the gains? Yeah, yeah, that should be good. Um, so I think this signal's not there anymore. Darn. So you can, other, well, let's see. So there's, you can demodulate stuff. Um, narrow FM is, let me plug this in. Okay, that doesn't work. Um, So this is just static. Um, see, is there anything here? So that's some modem thing, probably, maybe. Um, other interesting. <laughs> so that's something. <laughs> so, 
like a lot of radios that you see used at places are either just simple FM modulation or they use something called P25 or Project 25 which is it's designed so like all emergency services have the same radios that can work with each other and it, it's, it's encrypted or it can be encrypted but it's the encryption has been broken and there's stuff for a software defined radio like Osmo, the Osmo SDR project has a bunch of stuff on it and one of them is Project 25 and the encryption can be broken because it's the encryption itself isn't implemented properly and it's also pretty vulnerable to jamming because there are a few important packets that you can jam and it breaks the whole thing. Question? No, so one of the nice things is they don't know that you're receiving unless you transmit or you tell everyone like I am now. <laughs> yes. Not yet. Wow. You ever do any research in the numbers business? Um, I've heard of them. I, I've heard, oh, have I ever done any research in number stations? I've heard of them. I haven't really found any of them and they have the internet now, so it's not so popular. Yeah, well, so they're interesting. I've heard of them. I haven't really, I don't really think there are any number stations near here. Um, I haven't really spent the time looking for them. Um, yeah. Questions? Oh. Can you speak up? The IME. Yeah. Does some work with that. Uh, that too, but originally there was a little work done with the dongle. Oh. So the dongle, the way the IME is designed to work is it's it's so cool, so connected. Um, <laughs> I'm quoting from its promotional material. I mean, it's so connected. I can control my ceiling fan, jam radios, all sorts of fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, it can't do audio, um, but it can do some data. Probably decode pagers. Haven't done that. Um, but so the dongle, that, it's designed where you plug the dongle in your computer. You have software on the computer that connects it to your the internet and lets you message with people. And this is like your own phone messaging thing. Um, I've played around with the dongle some. I haven't really done much with it because it's eh. Um, what's interesting is they use a, a Cypress USB thing in it, but the ChipCon 1111 chip, which is just like the ChipCon 1110 that's in here, except it has USB, they could have used instead. Um, I think there's a lot more work being done with the IME because it has it, a screen and keyboard, and if you, like the dongle, you can pretty much replace it with software defined radio and get more functionality. It's, it's, also, if you wanted a really cheap one, you could just use the Realtek dongle. It comes with a really bad antenna that works surprisingly well. <laughs> yes? So, right now you just listen to someone's conversation, yeah. and you mentioned that there's like something that can send you a notification if you're being detected. Like, what or so the notification is that the NSA had something where they'd had a fake GSM base station and when they, looking at the phones it's the IM something something number the one the IMEI. yes IMEI or IMSI I think it's IMEI they could say it entered they would get a notification and could do the NSA stuff um, for this they can't know because I'm not transmitting um, it could transmit something um, there's, you can't really know that someone's listening with RF. It's like if you're shouting to a bunch of people, you can't, and there's someone in the next room, and there's someone over there, and I don't know if they're listening or not, because they can hear me. They may or may not be listening. Um, so you can't know if someone's listening. Um, things like GSM, um, it's being phased out and replaced with things like LTE and other cell phone technologies that are that are better and have encryption that's stronger and works well. Uh, GSM when it's encrypted, you can still use rainbow tables to kind of get around it. I don't really know much. There's other research online about GSM, but to answer your question, you can't really 
you can't tell that someone's listening or you so you could know if someone goes in like if say someone has a, th a thing that d transmits wherever you could set up something where it listens and when it detects that it sends you a notification yes have I done any of tracking of aircraft? Yes, and actually, let's try that. Um, it's, it's, it's not, ooh, this is nice. Also, it's nice, the antenna's magnetic. So if you have a, a MacBook, the, in the top of the lid, there are magnets that hold it shut, so you can stick it there, or you can stick it on any other metal surface. Um, I've actually been like bored in an airport waiting for a flight, and it's fun. Um, oh. What's the network? I have Wi-Fi, yes. So this is cool. Um, um, yes, it should. OK. Uh, gain. This should. OK. Um, internet. Change. Uh, no, darn. Um, there we go. Internet. Um, um. So here you can. S we are not in Europe. So he this should start picking up planes. Um, so we're in Tempe somewhere here-ish. No, we're somewhere here. Um, let's see where we were here. No. Yes, we're here. Um, Sky Harbor is not that. We should see planes. Um, doo -doo -doo. Hmm. This should be working. Um, no planes. This is disappointing. Normally there are planes. Um, it might be this building, but yeah, so you can receive planes. Um, it, the protocol used is ADSB. Auto, it stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast Mode, or, or yes, Mode B, or Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. And in Mode S is the useful one where it transmits altitude, position, and like the plane and how fast it's moving. It's this is part of the FAA Next Gen thing. One of the problems, though, is that it isn't um, it isn't encrypted or authenticated. So you could don't do this. This is really mean to the uh, air traffic controllers who do a lot of work. But you could do something where you transmit a bunch you transmit a bunch of fake planes, which because it's it's not encrypted or authenticated or anything. You could do that. It's not a good idea. Um, and that's transmitting, so then the, they'll come back on you. Yeah, they will probably find you. Right now, it's receiving only. And this isn't, darn. Normally, this. I mean, this normally works. If no, it is. Hmm. This should be okay. Maybe there aren't any planes. I don't know. Well, I'll leave this running. Uh, yeah, all the planes vaporized. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. Um. I haven't really recorded anything. Um, it's, it's fun to look at things. Um, what's interesting is um, at, in the evening, when I'm home and looking at the 900 megahertz spectrum, um, occasionally you'll see like a bunch of brief, like it's, um, you see a bunch of channel hopping really quickly, which I'm guessing might be the power meters. I'm not sure. Um, it's kind of regular. Um, an another cool resource is there's a website called FCC.io, and if you look on something that transmits, like this or almost anything else, there's an FCC ID, 
you can type it in. So, you, so this is, uh, or let's see. Um, sure, let's do this one. And it redirects you to the FCC website search page and does, and it's nice. Um, and you can see the reports. So, um, uh, it's, yes, this one. This is the remote for the ceiling. No, this is the remote for our garage door, I think. And um, t so you can see internal photos of something which is, is like the remote thing for garage door opener. And you can actually look at a test, wait, test measurement report, which it, it tells you about it transmitting and where it transmits. I think what's a, there's a, there's some nice ones that actually give you the timing in the modulation data, um, which I, uh, P I Y L seven two seven eight P I Y L seven two eight one eight one eight this should work. So this is the one for the IME. And so you can look at internal photos of it. So you can take it apart without ever having to take it apart. Um, of internal photos. Occasionally you'll get schematics. Typically they file a letter of confidentiality request thing to say, please don't publish schematics, detailed diagrams and stuff because it's, no one can know this. Um, it, this has been reverse engineered and there's code for it. Um, test report. So the test report will show you a bunch of cool things. Um, it's kind of a lot of scrolling through, but they, they mention, like you'll see, it mentions, uh, like it's, here's the data. Typically, like the first part's the requirements, and then below it there's an appendix with the data. Um, you typically want to look for conducted emissions or intentional emissions, uh, or radiation. No, none of this, darn, that's annoying. So anything else should have uh, yeah nor other this doesn't have it um any planes no <laughs> yeah it's typically in the test maybe it's that this I think oh this looks like they split it into a bunch of different okay here it is. So here you can see, um, wait, 900 megahertz, one division. Yes, yeah, so this is like 900 megahertz right there. The here, so 800 to 10 gig, that's really wide. Um, so here it is, here you can actually see, this is from 900 to 910 megahertz, one megahertz per division. And here you can see, here's actually like this, or when this had the original code, it used, it, this looks like two FSK, so it would switch between two frequencies to send data. Um, the FCC, oh, th that was, that's the one I want. Um, this one is looking at it in the time domain. So here you're seeing like an, an er, this is for the duty cycle to make sure it's not transmitting too much in the ISM band. So this is looking at the pulse. And they typically tell, like here it tells you it's 3.4 milliseconds. Um, they have, what is it? Um, uh, any other questions? What's your call? Uh, KG7NPO. Is this it? Yeah. Well, good job. No, thank you.